what I'm talking to you about, almost nobody in the field knows anything that I'm saying here. And how do I know that? Because they're not using these techniques in their, in their clinics. If they, if they understood what I'm saying, they would be transitioning over to this immediately. Professor Seafried, there has been so much money invested on the war against cancer over the years. In research, people have been fundraising, trying to raise money to you know, continue to do research to try and find the cure. We've made very little progress given what we've been doing and the energy and money invested. Why do you think this is? Well, thank you, Jesse. Listen, according to the uh, National Cancer Institute, American, sorry, American Society uh, uh, for Cancer, um, we've made big progress. Okay, so you got it. They, we've dropped cancer deaths by 30, 30 something, 37%. Um, so they consider we're making big progress. American Cancer Society out of Atlanta, Georgia. So in the 1990s, early 1990s, we really instituted big, the anti-smoking campaign. So people stopped smoking because they realized it put them at risk for cancer. And the big drop or the great ad advantage that everybody is talking about, how much wonderful advance we've made in cancer is that the projection, had we not stopped smoking, we would have a lot more dead people from cancer today than we had in 1990. So what you do is you run out that, that uh, trajectory to 2023 and say, oh, if we continue to smoke, we would have had a lot more cancer. So the fact that we stopped smoking, we actually reduced the number of cancer deaths by 35% or whatever it is. But it's a projection from, from prevention, uh, no advance from any therapeutic treatments that were given. So most of the great advance in cancer over the last 30, 40 years came from the people not smoking. Now, the other problem we're having today now is that obesity is replacing cancer as a number one risk factor for, for, the, for the problem. So we're back to almost where we started from, and we're not making any real progress. The, the, the problem is, is that um, there's a misunderstanding about what the nature of the disease is, and this is the real issue. It's not so much smoke and mirrors as what the, uh, the, the cancer societies like to use. Um, it's the failed recognition that cancer is a metabolic disease. It's not a, it's not a genetic disease. So when you look at the treatments that you see for cancer patients, what are these treatments? Chemo, radiation, and some of these new immunotherapies. And we hear new drugs all the time being developed for cancer. And yet we, the more drugs that we develop for cancer, the more cancer we get. So uh, um, there's something seriously wrong here. And if you look back at the drugs we're developing, they're all based on the somatic mutation theory of the disease, which is cancer is a disease of somatic mutations. And that, um, you know, we, we have drugs that are precision medicine, targeted therapies, and all this kind of stuff. They, they make it seem like this is going to be the solution to the problem. It's not, uh, because the disease is not a genetic disease. So mo most of the stuff that we're using is largely irrelevant, and it's toxic, it hurts the patient, costs a lot of money, and it really doesn't do the job that you'd expect it to do. Of course, there are a few people that respond really, really well. And we use those people to justify why we need to continue uh, with this kind of strategy. But in the long run, uh, it's not going to help the majority of cancer patients that do end up dying, suffering from the treatments. So, and that has to do largely with the misunderstanding of what the nature underlying mechanism is for the disease. And as I said, it's a metabolic disease that can be, that's driven by two fuels, the sugar glucose and the amino acid glutamine. And these two fuels are the ones that drive the dysregulated cell growth, which is ultimately the definition of cancer. So when people say, what is cancer? It's dysregulated cell growth, cell division out of control. What is it driven by? It's driven by a form of energy that doesn't require oxygen. Oh yeah, well, what doesn't require oxygen? Well, fermentation mechanisms. Oh yeah, what's that? Well, you use fuels that don't require oxygen. What are these fuels? These fuels are the sugar glucose and the, and the amino acid glutamine. Wow, that seems simple. How come nobody's targeting these fuels to manage cancer? Because they think it's a genetic disease, not a metabolic disease. Not that complicated. You mentioned early on how all the progress being made, or at least the majority is when it comes to prevention because people aren't smoking as much. 
the doctors that are giving these treatments and the researchers who are coming up with these drugs, do you feel like they feel in their hearts that they're making progress or are they oblivious to what you're talking about there where it's just a smoking factor? Yeah, well, I, I think they intrinsically know. I mean, they're the guys treating the patients. Um, of course, they have some success, uh, but they also see a lot of failures. And um, But they're told what to do by, a, by the uh, AMA, Medical, American Medical Association. The standard of care is, is like written in granite. And their job is not to question the standard of care, but to follow the rules of the standard of care which then if you come in with lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, bladder cancer, they have a protocol that they use to treat that surgical first, perhaps radiation, perhaps a, a, a treatment program for a program for some drug. Um, and there by the grace of God, you survive. Uh, but a lot of people don't survive. And that's why we have over 1,600 people a day, every single day, dying from cancer in this country. And it's over 8,000 a day in China, and it's, it's rampant throughout the world. And they're talking about cancer replacing heart disease as the number one killer of people on the planet for a disease basis. So if, if they're already recognizing that cancer will overtake heart disease in the next year, and in fact, in, in China, it already has overtaken heart disease, that tells us that they're making no progress. Because if they were making progress, heart disease would remain as the number one killer, but cancer is now uh, uh, ready to overtake heart disease. So if we're making so, many, so much progress about the smoke and mirrors and all this other stuff, why, why, are we, why are we have so many people dying from cancer? 1,600 people a day dying. Think of all the people that are massively suffering from the treatments they received from this. Um, if you had something successful, you would be able to drop the death rate. Even, even President Biden in his State of the Union speech, he wants to drop cancer death rates by, I don't know, 50% in 30 years. We can drop that, we can drop that in five years, knowing what we know about the origin of, of cancer as a metabolic disease. Those numbers are easily achievable. If you switch the, the 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 paradigm, it's not a genetic disease; it's a metabolic disease. So if we treat the cancer as a metabolic disease, yeah, we're going to get what President Biden wants in a lot faster time. Well, the interesting thing is that you've been doing this research, you and your team and other teams, for years, and you know you've you've put together this case for what we're going to talk about today. And I'm just curious, what happens when you and your team release a paper in a major journal? And it does simplify things, again, what we're going to get into today. Like, how can that not get the recognition when it's so obvious that things aren't working the current way that they are? Yeah, you should, you know the reasons, right? Um, there's several reasons. Uh, number, number one, the dogma. The dogma says cancer is a genetic disease and uh, we must stay the course. That's one reason. The other reason is lack of knowledge. Most oncologists never heard of what I'm telling you. They don't read the scientific, they don't read these papers. So if you don't read the paper, how are you ever going to be told that what's right and what's not right? Um, when patients who do have great success with metabolic therapy go back to their oncologist, the oncologist says, wow, that's really good. Continue to do what you're doing. Well, don't you want to know what I'm doing? Why I, I'm not like the rest of your patients? No, I don't want to know that. Just continue to do what you're doing. These are the kinds of responses. And then most importantly, it's hard to get somebody to accept something when their salary depends on them not accepting it. So, uh, and I think that might be the uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have. So it's not one thing. It's, it's a group of things that prevent, and my papers are being read. Don't, don't get it wrong. It's just they're not being cited. <laughs> they're being essentially ignored. Well, where my curiosity is, just to go a little bit further into this, you know, why isn't a journalist out there realizing that he could basically make his or her career from, you know, printing an article that people understand in Time Magazine and, yeah. and getting this out to the masses? And, and you could be the recipient of a Nobel Prize. Like, there's... There is so much potential here for somebody to, to decipher and, and sift this information in a major publication like Time Magazine or the New York Times in a well, way people can understand it and grab onto it and start to get some momentum going. 
yeah, well, you know, it's not that easy. Uh, when a journalist would hear what we're saying, they run off to uh, MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber, and they ask the top oncologist, what do you think of this? Ah, there's no evidence to support that. <laughs> Rather than looking at the data themselves, and why don't you ask the patients who were survive? Uh, ask the ask the the multitudes of people that are surviving uh, as the result of this, and and don't think um, this is not going unnoticed. Uh, the documentary movie of uh, the cancer revolution, which is under construction, for part A has already been uh, developed, and they interview dozens of people that were so-called terminal. Uh, I'm, al there's, I'm alive. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm alive. I'm alive. Blah, 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 all back and forth. So how long will it take? And don't forget, most people prefer to watch The Bachelor uh, rather than documentaries, right? I mean, you have to look at the, look at the, look at what people are watching. You think they want to watch a, a, a show on cancer versus a really exciting uh, uh, show about The Bachelor? I mean, that's where the mentality, that's where the mindset is. People, people have enough problems in their life. They don't want to be talking about cancer unless, unless it aff affects them directly. And then when it affects them directly, where do they go? They go to the top medical schools. And then they ask them, what about metabolic? Oh, no, no. Meta if, if metabolic therapy were, were real, I, I would have heard about it. Okay. Where are the clinical trials? Yeah, I can't believe anything unless I see a clinical trial supporting. You can't do a clinical trial on the kinds of metabolic therapy we do with double-blind crossovers. It would be immoral to do that. A person to do metabolic therapy, it's diet-drug combos, and you can't do the strategy uh, uh, the way it's being done currently in, in, in the pharmaceutical attempts to make drugs for, for, for uh, clinical trials. So, so we have to redesign the types of clinical trials, compare it to um, what we call uh, historic controls, okay? So for glioblastoma, the brain tumor, you know, um, if, you, if you're surviving after five years, there may be five or 7% of people that get standard of care that actually survive five years. Okay, so we're not going to put in a group of GBM patients that get radiation and chemo. And, uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, they will, not let, they will not do the critical control group. And they do this for a lot of cancers. So we're going to use standard of care, which is radiation and chemo, plus metabolic therapy. Okay, how does that work? But where is your metabolic therapy group by itself? to compare standard of care, standard of care with metabolic therapy, metabolic therapy by itself. Ah, uh, can't do that. Sorry. So the very system will not allow this stuff to get through the system because God forbid it works. Suppose the metabolic therapy, people live a hell of a lot longer than standard of care or even standard of care with metabolic therapy. What's going to happen? So correct me if I'm wrong. What you're saying here is the fact that we can't get a clean trial where we get to see metabolic therapy on its own because of ethics. Yeah, and Ethics. what they're doing, or I, I can't, I'm not sure if it's you and your team or other researchers, but what we've been able to do is do standard of care chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and then apply metabolic therapy after the body's been quote unquote trashed by those. And what I, from hearing you talk on other conversations, it sounds like the therapy we're going to talk about today because it is so effective, is able to help people even after their body's been trashed. Yeah, that's true. At least in some instances. Yeah, it, it is. You're absolutely right. In some instances, not all instances. Okay. There's some people, especially for glioblastoma, I mean, radiation liquefies your brain. So uh, uh, even, even you, you can't ask a metabolic therapy to uh, to you know stop the radiation from liquefying. It actually can help you, but it and the people that survive, and there have been a few studies that have been uh, standard of care with metabolic therapy, um, who are in fact doing better. Uh, there's no question about it. But could they even do better? I think they can do massively better if you didn't irradiate the brain. I have shown in no uncertain terms that radiation of the brain is like the worst thing you can do to a brain cancer patient. Why? Because it frees up massive amounts of the two fuels that are absolutely necessary for the growth of those tumor cells and survival, the glucose and the glutamine. When you irradiate the brain, you free up massive amounts of glutamine, which fuel those cancer cells, make them resistant to chemotherapy and resistant to more radiation. 
And it's just like nuts. And no matter how many times that I write these papers in excruciating detail, describing in no uncertain terms how the radiation of the brain is causing the recurrence of the tumor and the death of their patients, it, you might as well be talking to a stone because it doesn't have any impact on the people doing these kinds of treatments. So um, you have to look at it and say, wow, you're continuing to treat these people with a therapy you know does not work. And it may, in fact, lead to their demise. And yet you continue to do that over and over and over again. Why is that? What could explain another human being doing that to a, a person? And, and these are the kinds of things that nobody wants to touch with a 10-foot pole because you have to change the standard of care. And the standard of care is like written in granite. And, and there's a lot of revenue to be generated from these standards of care. So until you come in with a business model that can replace the revenue from standard of care, standard of care will maintain in place regardless of the outcome. And people say, how could you say that stuff? I says, why don't you look at the death certificates? Why don't you look at the survival curves from every major hospital in the world doing this kind of a therapy? It's abysmal. And yet they do it. All right. Let's get really granular here and talk about the metabolic therapy. So if somebody were to have a brain tumor, we'll use the glioblastoma like you mentioned earlier. We know glutamine and, and eliminating that plus eliminating glucose is part of the treatment. Let's talk really again on a granular level what that looks like. How does somebody begin to, to do that through diet and drugs? Well, yeah, the first thing, the first thing now, the GBM, you, you, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a call on the surgeon. They have to make a decision because some GBM, if it's not operated on immediately, it could herniate and kill that patient very, very quickly. So everything is a, a judgment call on the part of the surgeon. A surgeon has to do MRI, um, uh, a variety of different uh, uh, scans uh, to evaluate where that tumor is, the size of it, if it's impacting. Uh, not all the time, but many times you have a watchful waiting period before you have to have the tumor removed surgically. We're not, we're not against, you've got to, we, uh, there's thousands of articles, I wouldn't say thousands, hundreds of articles in the scientific literature showing that the more I can debulk, uh, the, get rid of it, the longer the patient will survive. No question about that. The issue, of course, is that if you have a watchful waiting period, this is an angry mess. And I'm not talking, I'm t I could be talking about uh, liver cancer. I could be talking about bladder, uh, colon, lung, they all have a lot of inflammation in the microenvironment. A lot of it's kind of bloody, bloody and angry, uh, uh, inflamed, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you you want to reduce local inflammation as best you can, so that when you do the surgical debulking, you have more sharp edges around that tumor, and that when you do the debulking, you're going to get a lot more of the tumor than if you go into uh, go after this tumor like a bull in a in a, in a china shop, because you're going to create a, a mess. And that mess is going to elicit these tumor cells to invade and, and disseminate through the brain. So you really want to get as many tumor cells back into the central mass as possible. And you can do that by water-only fasting, extremely restricted ketogenic diets. You can get the inflammation in that air to be less than it is. You make the mass less angry, less inflamed. Surgeon comes in, debulks. Already, that patient will have a, 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 an advantage to survive better just because the surgeon was able to take more. How do I know that? Because we did the experiments here in the lab. We calculated all the angiogen, the bl bad blood vessels, the inflammation. We measured all the biomarkers and biochemical readouts for these things. And we can see it. The demarcation comes really sharp. Inflammation goes down. Angiogenesis goes down, which is abnormal blood vessel development. So you have all of the markers and some of the tumor cells start to die. So all of this is really favorable therapeutic response if you have a watchful waiting period. So then the surgeon takes it out. And then after the surgeon would take it out, you would then transition back onto metabolic therapy. And there's a number of different drugs that we can use to facilitate calorie-restricted ketogenic diets, water-only fasting. These drugs are designed to specifically target the glucose and glutamine pathways in those tumor cells while not harming any of the normal cells of the body. So you don't have uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hair loss, all this crazy stuff. You know, you're going specifically at the heart of what those tumor cells need to survive. And then you hope for the best and 
And we're not like our one patient, Pablo Kelly, who has a, a website, he talks about his survival over eight years now. His tumor is not cured. It continues to grow, but it was made indolent. So every three or four years, he has a debulking surgery and goes back about his life. So I, I think I think a lot of people think we should cure cancer. Of course, everybody would like to cure cancer. But the second best thing is learning to live with it. If you had a terminal cancer and you're not terminal, uh, you might be at some point, but you're outliving by, by, by long periods what you would have been expected to live. What's wrong with that? So uh, in other words, can you have effective management with maintaining a high quality of life? Um, and maybe you eventually will die from this tumor, but you won't die in the time frame that 98% of the people are dying and you're going to live a lot longer. So the idea is this is a, a very new strategy for managing cancer. Is it perfected? No. Do we understand the problems? Yes. Can we divine, d design strategies to deal with the problems? Absolutely. So it, it's a work in progress. But in the end, you want GBM patients to survive a minimum of five years, not uh, of two people surviving after five years, you want them. You want at least half of the patients to be alive at five years, and that's not what we're seeing today. And I can go through the list of every major cancer: breast cancer, colon cancer, bladder cancer, liver cancer. They're all. They all have the same problem. They need glucose and glutamine. We found that. We know that. We we know that. So it's a singular strategy, tweaked a little bit different for each type of cancer, but it's basically the same strategy. This is not what people, what, what the industry wants to hear. Believe me. So when we go to cut off the glucose supply, which is feeding the cancer cell and allowing them to ferment and make more energy, you mentioned their water fasting and the ketogenic diet. I'm curious for somebody who does decide to take on one of those as the dietary piece to address that part of the cancer. Is there a difference in the research showing one being better than the other? Obviously the water fasting is more extreme. Is it more effective to go that extreme? No, um, th there's a, we use the glucose ketone index calculator, which we published here. Um, that gives the patient, every patient with cancer can then know how they stand. So it's a meter. You can buy it on Amazon, a keto mojo glucose ketone in index meter, a meter that measures blood sugar. You prick your finger like a diabetic would. You measure with a strip. You can measure your blood sugar. You put it. You put the strip in the meter. Reads the sugar. Okay. Squeeze your finger a little bit more. Put the ketone strip. Put that in the meter. It tells you what your ketones are. You push the button and you get a ratio of how much ketone to, to glucose is in the blood. And normally people would look at that on a right after their lunch or dinner or whatever, and you'd have a value of about fifty or sixty. Okay. To manage cancer, you need a value of two point zero or below. Okay, people say, oh man, I don't know if I can get that. They eat this and go, oh, can I eat that? Can I eat this? I don't know. Why don't you check your GKI, your glucose ketone index, and see whether you can eat that? And they said, oh no, it went up to 20. I well, don't eat that. So it's not that hard. And then they, they'll come and say, oh, oh man, it's really, really hard to, to, to get my blood sugars down and my ketones up. And I said, well, I, I said, you want to kill cancer cells? <laughs> or do you, what, what's your plan here? It's not easy. What, don't, you know, I don't want people to think. I'll tell you, it's a hell of a lot easier sitting down in, in, in the, in the uh, oncology thing and getting infused with poison. You don't have to do anything. You just sit in a lounge chair and they just drain it into your bloodstream. Doing metabolic therapy requ requires a big part, on, a, a big a, 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 emphasis on, a, effort on your part. The patient has to play a major role in the management of the disease. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So uh, when the patient can get down into that low uh, or that low GKI value, then the patient becomes uh, a, 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 now the next step is use specific drugs that work better against the glucose and glutamine together. So you got the diet on the one side, uh, making you healthier, putting pressure on the tumor cells, but then you hit them with low doses of a variety of other, and some of that can be low dose chemo, by the way. And then you just mail, start hammering these tumor cells out of existence. So, uh, uh, and the, degrade them slowly while you continue to be healthy. Uh, none of this hair loss, vomiting, and all this other stuff. The tumor cells cannot survive in these harsh and metabolic environments. You're doing it by lowering your sugar, and you, then you take small doses of 
like repurposed drugs and things like we already listed some of these. The more of them are becoming recognized. So um, you don't you don't need to spend a lot of money. Now, as I said, uh, you don't need to suffer with a lot of toxicity. Is it easy? No. If I had, I know what I'd have to do. But do you think I'm going to be saying, oh, Mao, I can't eat donuts and rice and bread? Okay, well, that might be the part of your sacrifice. And what a lot of people do, they dovetail it in with prayer. Whatever religion they are, they pray, and that helps them uh, avoid bread. And In other words, it gives them more motivation to, to participate in their own healing process. What we found is that the human body has incredible capacity to heal itself, if given the opportunity. So when you give your body the opportunity to heal, it will heal. It's hard to heal when you're being irradiated and treated with drugs that are poisonous. It's hard for the body to rally against that. So uh, um, I think we have to change this whole paradigm by the way cancer is treated, and we can get much better success than what we have currently today. One point I want to highlight there, the fact that blood glucose is still going to be elevated to a point. Even if we're fasting, doing water fasting over a longer period of time, we're still going to maintain a relative level of blood glucose, mm. which for me yeah. triggers in my mind, it's not like you're having rice or a donut and spiking that blood glucose, but you still have that baseline level no matter what you're doing. How is that not enough to facilitate fuel for the cancer cells? Yeah. So it becomes, it's a very, it's a, it's a population dynamics issue. Okay. When, when you have a high enough level of blood sugar from eating, um, uh, carbohydrates or whatever. Uh, the brain is, is satiated. Uh, most of the other cells in your body are satiated. You already have a, a massive amount of uh, excess glucose because you're eating foods that produce glucose. So if you stop eating from foods that produce glu glucose, your body now has to replace the glucose with something else. And they mobilize fats and the fats go to the liver and the liver uh, produces ketone bodies. But the liver will also produce glucose through the process of gluconeogenesis. But gluconeogenesis cannot make up the need for how much glucose your brain needs. So there's going to be a shortage. So what's going to happen then is your brain is going to take what little glucose is available to do its and then replace the rest of it with ketone bodies. So this deprives the cells, the other cells in your body, of 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 glucose and other cells in the body now also increase their demand for this glucose because glucose is a good fuel for a lot of things. So you can now the tumor cells, which absolutely must have that fuel, are now competing with all other cells that also want the same fuel, but they wouldn't have competed with the tumor cells when the glucose was so high. So the tumor cells were free to do what they want to do. You lower the blood sugar. Now these cells are in direct competition with other cells in the body. And eventually they start to lose the fight. They, they need the glucose. These other guys can burn ketones and glucose. These guys can't burn the ketones. They can't burn fatty acids. So they're, they're, they're linked to two fuels. One of them is glucose. And the other is this glutamine, which is an amino acid, which is the most abundant amino acid in the body. No diet can target the availability of the glutamine. That's why you have to come in with a little bit of a drug that will push that glutamine down, thereby starving these tumor cells of the two key fuels that they need. So you need to know how to play the normal cells off the tumor cells. You need to know how to reconstruct the energy uh, uh, um, bioenergetic system in the body so that the tumor cells are now in a fight for their life, for their struggle, where the rest of the body can transition off to another fuel. This is the way, the strategy that, that, we, that we can use. So the other thing you have to realize that no one denies is that all the tumor cells have thousands of mutations. They all, everybody knows that. They have mutations because their energy is inefficient. They perform these reactive oxygen species causing mutations in the DNA. So when you have a cells, all these tumor cells full of genetic mutations, and now you're taking the whole body and putting it into, a re, uh, into an energetic restricted state, Normal cells evolved over millions of years to adapt to these restricted states. They make great efficiency at a small availability of molecules that can be uh, respired in the environment. The tumor cell has all these mutations. It traps them. It, it prevents them from making rapid adaptations because the mutations block all of the... They have no fle metabolic flexibility. So that then puts them at a massive competitive disadvantage 
when they're up against the normal cells that have this metabolic flexibility. So you put all that together, lack of metabolic flexibility, restriction of the two fuels that are absolutely essential for their existence. And you target this while you're transitioning over. And these tumor cells are gradually eliminated and degraded slowly. And the, and the, in, the material used from these dead tumor cells is now recycled into the normal cells of the body. The body will turn and eat the tumor cells as part of the fuel when you have under these, it's unbelievable. It's, it's when you understand the when you understand the bioenergetics of your body and what it's capable of doing, you know how these tumor cells can be blasted uh, very effectively by just using a few uh, uh, strategies that uh, is based on evolutionary biology and understanding of the biology of the tumor. You talked about the genetic mutations within the tumor, and for anybody that might be confused, because early on in our conversation we said that. That's the current paradigm that doctors go by, the genetic mutations. Well, we're saying we're not denying there are genetic mutations. It's the fact that we're going more upstream yeah. and saying that those are just a factor that happens later on, not the actual cause at the very right. top. Yeah, they, they're, they're uh, 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 completely correct. Um, they collect. And the more the tumor is aggressive, the more mutations they, they collect. But those mutations also block metabolic adaptation. So as soon as you start restricting the two fuels absolutely essential for the growth of the tumor, the viability of the tumor, those tumor cells lack the ability to get energy from oxygen. That's the key. The tumor cell can get, cannot get energy from oxygen. It can only get energy from uh, what we call substrate level phosphorylation. It's a, non, it's, a, it's a form of energy that doesn't require oxygen. Okay, so it's an ancient pathway. All the cells that existed on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere used this same energy mechanism, energy without oxygen. This is very interesting because, we, because tumor cells, as I said, what Otto Warburg did years ago uh, with animals that had tumors, uh, he would give the animal cyanide, which kills the animal immediately. But the tumor cells aren't killed. The tumor cells can grow in cyanide. They can grow without oxygen. So that clearly tells you these, so what are they, wow, you mean to tell me a tumor cell can grow in cyanide? I said, yeah, we've, we've done it. So cyanide kills people instantly, but the tumor cell is not killed by the cyanide. Why is that? Because it's not using oxygen. It's using ancient pathways to get energy. What are those pathways? Well, it's a fermentation mechanism. Wow, what are the glycolysis in the cytoplasm, glutaminolysis in the mitochondria. So we know exactly what pathways these tumor cells are using. And I, I said, well, how do you know that? Because we, we targeted those pathways, kills the tumors right away. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that complicated. People, oh, wow, you, so many, because the field is saying, okay, you've got 10,000 mutations in there. Our precision medicine is going to target one of those mutations or a couple of them. I, that's not going to work. It's got a, each tumor cell has different constellation and mutations. So it's, it's definitely not going to work. It doesn't work for the majority of people. As a matter of fact, some of those uh, targeted mutations turn on the body and blow out your liver, blow out your kidneys. Um, they can kill you faster than the tumor can kill you. If you have the same epitope on a normal cell uh, that you thought was only on the tumor cell, so when you give them this immunotherapy, it not only will hit a few of those tumor cells with that marker, but it also starts knocking out your liver and kidney that have that same mark. So uh, um, the, what we see is called hyper-progressive disease. It's, it's something you see in, you know, um, when you see on TV at night, all the commercials for all these ca uh, cancer things, uh, and on the bottom, it, it'll kill you in 15 different ways. <laughs> <laughs> they make that real small, that part real small. That should be the number one part. This drug will kill you in 15 different ways, but you might be one of the few ones that are lucky to survive. <laughs> it's a crazy world. <laughs> it's a crazy world, man, but you got to live with it, you know? Coming back to the dietary piece. So your research shows we either want to adopt a ketogenic diet or go to water fasting when it comes to fighting cancer. And we know what that's doing so far. We talked about it cuts off the fuel supply of the glucose to the cancer. My question is, when we get into that state of ketosis through either of those means, are the ketones themselves part of the therapy? Are they attacking or causing an environment that the cancer doesn't like? Yeah, that's a good point. We, we tried that. Um, and you, the cancer cells can grow. Um, in the present key. So we, as long as we have glucose and glutamine there, uh, you can put ketones in there. Okay. You have to get to really, really high levels, like 10 millimolar before the, the ketones might act as a toxic. 
And the body, the human body, it's hard to get up to 10 millimolar. So uh, most people are in two to four, and maybe if they're lucky, one to three, up to five millimolar, maybe a little higher. Um, the, per, the role, the primary role of the ketone bodies is to enhance the energetic efficiency of normal cells in the body. So the, that's their primary role. Also, by elevating ketones, it allows the body to push blood sugars down as low as you possibly can get. Because you, because you can even shoot up uh, insulin into a person who is in therapeutic ketosis. Like, like for example, um, if, if you take a person and shoot them up with a high dose of insulin, they, they go unconscious, they have an epileptic seizure and possibly could die uh, because you've removed all of the sugar in the blood immediately. So the brain has no energy and you go unconscious. If you take those same people and put them in therapeutic ketosis like Drenick did, this Dr. Drenick, and, and had their ketones elevated to about four millimolar and then shot them up with a high dose of insulin, nothing. Was no no effect at all. Why? Because the ketones were replacing the glucose as the fuel for the brain. So as long as you can transition, the brain can switch from glucose to ketone bodies. The tumor cell cannot switch from glucose to ketone bodies. Why? Because you need a good mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria is the organelle that gets energy from oxygen, and that organelle is busted, inefficient, and broken oxidative phosphorylation part of that organelle is broken. So they can't use ketones or fatty acids because you can't, you need a good healthy mitochondria to use those. So once you know the biology of the cancer cell and the biology of the normal cells, you just play one group of cells off the other in the correct metabolic environment and the tumor cells lose every time. When it comes to that experiment you talked about where somebody's in ketosis and they're able to use insulin to really bring that glucose down, was that just a thought experiment or has that actually been done? And no, if done. so, is that something that can be therapeutic to even cut off that fuel supply even more to the cancer cells? It might be. Um, I have the paper here, Drenick, look it up. You know, it's, it's, I, 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 I couldn't believe it. He took all these really obese people, massively obese, and uh, put them on a water-only fast for 21 days, uh, brought their blood sugars down and their, and their ketones up, and then shot them up with insulin bringing the blood sugar down to 0 0.5 millimolar, nine milligrams per deciliter. That's death for anybody that doesn't, is, that's not in ketosis. Those people are fine. They didn't even have any cognitive changes at all. So it was absolutely proven that you can do this. You can push blood, the blood as long as you are in ketosis, you're protected against the, the effects of low hypoglycemia. You go to the hospitals and you say, oh, you got to get your cancer patients down into about 55 to 65 milligrams. Oh no, that's going to kill them. You don't know about the keto. You don't know how to do this. I mean, you guys are medical professionals. You should know how to play these organs and these systems off each other to be successful in the treatment of the disease. So getting back to your question about can insulin potentiation therapy be uh, one of the procedures that could use? You know, I don't know. I know our, some of our colleagues in Istanbul use it. Some people have uh, said they've gotten a really good uh, results as the result of that, but you got to make sure your patients are in therapeutic ketosis, nutritional ketosis, before you would want to mess around with that. Also, you got to realize that this is not a long-term uh, situation. We, they they showed how long does it how long does the patient survive in this very very low glucose condition using insulin and in, 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 and you're talking about you know several hours. Uh, you're not talking about several days. You, in order to kill the cancer cells, you, you really need to apply the pressure constantly over a significant period of time where they're gradually degraded and gradually broken down and, 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 and gradually managed. Insulin will kill a lot of cells maybe right off the bat, but it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be, I, I don't think it, it, it's, it, it might be used occasionally a little bit of a pulse, but I'm not going to bank using it. And also you got to be careful if your patients aren't in ketosis, when you do that, you could run the risk of harm. Um, you know, there's a lot of things one has to be uh, cognizant of, uh, before you would want to do that. But the answer to your question is, yeah, you can lower blood sugar down to almost zero, uh, with an insulin potentiation therapy while the patient is in ketosis, not when the patient is not in ketosis, you would never, ever do something like that. The other potential challenge I can see with using that insulin with a cancer patient is the fact that we know that's a growth hormone. And I'm curious how, you know, that might be able to affect 
the growth of cancer? Well, as I said, you can't grow without energy. Energy is the key. Uh, you have two things. You have metabolites for growth, but you also have the energy. You can have all the metabolites in the world, but you don't have the energy to use them. You're going to die. So everything comes back to energy. So you have to have two things to grow cancer cells. You have to have energy and you have to have metabolites. So you have the metabolites and the energy and you'll be able to grow these cells. So both the glucose and the glutamine not only provide the energy together, they also provide the metabolites. The nitrogen from glutamine is necessary for DNA and RNA synthesis and the synthesis of all amino acids. The carbons from glucose are absolutely essential for running the pentose phosphate pathway and providing the raw material for the synthesis of proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So you put all those, the carbons from those two fuels are absolutely essential for the growth of those tumor cells. They can't use anything else in any sufficient capability. And in order to grow an inefficient beast, a, a growing tumor cell, which is highly energetically inefficient, you have to have logistics. The supply of the fuels used for their fermentation mechanism have to be present in the environment in sufficient quantities to drive the beast because, uh, the, because you need a lot of fuel that is inefficient. Okay. So if that's the key, you have two fuels that are necessary, that are abundant in the microenvironment, and the cancer cell will be able to grow and be resistant to almost everything you throw at it. But if you take away those two fuels and clean up the, the environment, these cells now become extremely vulnerable uh, for killing and management without toxicity. Coming back to my question earlier about the ketones and if they have a therapeutic role in this, it gets me thinking about exogenous ketones. And I know you mentioned there it would have to be this really high level of ketones in the body before they would be toxic to cancer. I'm curious, has there been any research or testing done of using this exogenous ketone, ketones, yeah, as a way yeah. of, you know, an adjunct to therapy? Yeah. Uh, Adam D'Agostino, my friend from University of South Florida, is developing these ketone uh, 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 supplements that you could possibly use. And what we're finding is that if you do get yourself into a state of therapeutic ketosis where um, your ketone levels are about three to four millimolar, and your blood sugar level is maybe 50 or 60 milligrams per deciliter, when you take the ketone supplements, your blood sugar can be pushed to even a lower grade, a degree, and uh, your ketones can be even elevated to a, to a higher level. Uh, again, putting more pressure on the tumor cells. Um, but we haven't worked yet that into a, um, a therapeutic strategy. It's, it's based on dosage, timing, and scheduling. And in order to fully fully uh, take advantage of uh, exogenous ketones, we, we need to follow more uh, patients uh, uh, and measure their blood sugar and ketones while we are monitoring their tumor non-invasively, uh, either by PET, PET analysis or by MRI or CAT scan or some of these non-invasive ways, uh, monitoring if there's a linkage between visual, visible shrinkage of the tumor linked to uh, levels of blood sugar and ketones uh, in the patient. So we can then get more quantitative information with respect to that. And that, as far as I know, hasn't been done yet. You know, right now we're just in the process of, of, of how long can we keep a patient alive with a high quality of life um, based on our concepts, but it's gonna take uh, more clinical uh, and preclinical research uh, to get the exact answer to your question. So we've talked about the dietary piece quite a bit now through the glucose half of the equation. When it comes to glutamine, let's talk about the different drug options there and the physiology of how that stops that fuel from being used by the cancer. Yeah, well, um, there's several ways. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the body, um, higher than any other amino acid in the bloodstream. It's an absolutely, they call it a non-essential amino acid because you can synthesize it from glucose. Uh, it's essential for neurotransmission in the brain, the glutamine glutamate cycle. So it's a very crucial uh, um, metabolite amino acid in, in the brain for keeping our neurons firing in a, in a correct way. Um, it's an absolutely essential metabolite for cells of our immune system, uh, like macrophages, T cells, and B cells, the cells of our immune system uh, require uh, a lot of glutamine. And of course, in our gut, 
uh, our gut, the health of our guts, uh, uh, crypt cells and all these kinds of cells in our intestines, uh, they're also big users of, of the glutamine. So when you say, okay, um, we're going to try to target cancer cells also, the metastatic cancer cell, the metastatic cancer cell is a big uh, consumer of glutamine. Uh, because the metastatic cell, as we and others have shown, is actually derived from uh, an immune cell in our body called the macrophage. It's a fusion hybridization kind of a thing. So um, they spread through the body, but they also sit next to immune cells. They suppress immune cells, but they're also consuming glutamine. So how do we go after the glutamine in the cancer cell without harming the, 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 the normal cells that also need the glutamine? So this is why we use the press, uh, the pulse strategy. Okay, so we press the whole body uh, of glucose, uh, raising ketones, lowering glucose as a constant press uh, on the cancer cells. So they become less aggressive, more indolent, less inflamed. And then we take low doses of glutamine inhibitors that can inhibit any part of the glutaminolysis pathway coming from the bringing into glutamine, uh, metabolizing it to glutamate, metabolizing it to alpha-ketoglutarate, to succinyl-CoA, to succinate. There's a pathway. And this is the pathway by which the cancer cells use to get their energy. So we can hit that pathway at any one of these steps, but we have to do it in a very strategic way as to not harm normal cells that need that same pathway. So that's why we pulse small doses of this as we keep, we, we got the cancer cells in a metabolic chokehold, but we're not, yet, we're not ready to kill them yet. But we got to hit them with a little pulse and eventually they'll expire. But you got to do it in such a way as to not harm. This is why you need a fundamental understanding of biology. You need to understand the biology of all the key players that are participatory in the eventual management of the disease. So you can't go in there like a bull in a china shop and just you know pour chemicals and poisons and radiation and all this kind of crazy shit. You can get rid of some cancer like that for sure, but you really can do it in a hell of a lot easier way, more strategic and less toxic if you understand how to play these pathways off of each other in the different kinds of cells that are in the tumor microenvironment. And eventually you degrade the tumors down to a point where they become assimilated and used for fuel by the rest of the cells. So you're absolutely right. You can't throw a whole bunch of glutamine targeting drugs. Sure, you're going to kill some cancer cells, but then you're going to paralyze your immune system because once you kill a bunch of cancer cells, who's going to come in and pick up the dead bodies of the cancer cells? You got a whole bunch of corpse, dead corpses of cells where that tumor used to be. And if you don't get rid of them, bacteria can get in there, cause some infection. You got a, another problem on your hands. So you got to be able to do this in a logical, strategic way to get rid of the tumor cells. I mean, all of this becomes extremely uh, comprehensible uh, when you understand the biology of the key players that are, that are participatory in the growth of this uh, malignancy. So uh, again, um, you know, it, it's just that we've been doing this for a long time. We study the biology of all the different participants in the microenvironment. We study who's, who's doing what in these cancer cells, why they're spreading, how can they not, how, we, how do we kill them? And, uh, and, you know, we're seeing success in people and in dogs, you know, we're starting to see success in our strategy and it's just a matter of po polishing it up and perfecting it to get a real, a, a, a real strategic way of dealing with this problem. So when it comes to order of treatment, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's to get into ketogenic a ketogenic state before you start pulsing the dawn. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, because because we showed in our publications that we could get three times more uh, glutamine targeting drug uh, through the blood brain barrier onto target when the drug was would be administered under therapeutic ketosis. So if you try to administer the drug in a, in a high carbohydrate diet, American, American standard diet or whatever, you only get a little bit of drug on target. Therefore, you have to use a lot more of the drug. And when you use a lot more of the drug, you risk, you risk the toxicity issues that can come with the use of any drug given in, in excessive amounts. So what you want to do is, is you want to make that drug super powerful in lowest doses possible. And that is what the, the therapeutic ketosis does. It allows small molecules to come right on target, low dose, massively more powerful than they would have been if they were not used. This is another thing. You got to understand the biology of the problem to make your success much greater than it would have been. 
Again, nobody, what I'm talking to you about, almost nobody in the field knows anything that I'm saying here. And how do I know that? Because they're not using these techniques in their, in their clinics. If they, if they understood what I'm saying, they would be transitioning over to this immediately. But they're not. Why? Oh, I never heard of this before. Oh, I didn't know about it. You go ask them. Oh, I didn't know. No, there's no evidence to support. Did you read the paper? No, I didn't read the paper. Then how do you know there's no evidence to support that? You can go right down the list. You know, And you have to give these guys a break too. These oncologists, they were never trained to look at bio cancer this way. They're memorizing all kinds of stuff, you know, knowing how to use chemicals and radiation so you don't kill your, your poor patient. They're not looking at the biological strategies for knowing how to kill cancer cells without toxicity. They were never trained in the medical schools to know how to use diets and drugs, combos of diets and drugs to, to manage these things. So, so it's, it's a lack of knowledge, lack of training. Uh, no motivation. I mean, you put it all together and you, and, and, and you don't get what I'm telling you. You don't get that applied in the clinic. One of the big things that jumps out to me too, as you talk about doctors, is the fact that even if, say, they tune into an interview like this and become aware or read your book, they have the legal ramifications hmm. if they try something alternative yeah. like this. So the way I understand it, at least, and I'm no lawyer, is that they're sort of handcuffed in a way to follow a certain protocol or the college is going to crack down on them. So that's another yeah. whole layer to this. That's a, another whole layer. That's what I'm talking about. No flexibility in the standard of care. The standard of care was never written in granite. It's only supposed to be used because based on best medical practices and outcome, it should be used until something better comes along. Something better is here, but why now can you not use it? Then you have to say, oh, there's something other than patient outcome that must be underlying the lack of ability to use this new uh, approach to managing cancer. So that becomes a different level of uh, investigation. You know, why, why they don't want to do this? Uh, wh what are the real reasons for not wanting to do this? And I told you at the beginning, there's a number of reasons why people can't do that. Um, yeah, the hospital administrators. Um, you know, you have to look at bottom lines and budgets and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you're going to bring in a, a, a treatment protocol that's not going to generate the revenue that you got from something else. Then we got, we got to reevaluate whether we want to do that or not. Uh, people say, wow, are you sure about that? Go ahead. Go find out why you can't use metabolic therapy as a standalone next to, oh no, can't do that. Why? It doesn't go through the institutional review board. We have a, a group of, of, of physicians on institutional review boards that have to make the decision. They'll allow metabolic therapy under certain cases as long as it's done con concurrently with the standard of care. The standard of care is your problem. So you got to get rid of the standard. It's not working. The standard of care for brain cancer, at least for brain for glioblastoma, is not working. It's not working for advanced lung cancer. It's not working for advanced breast cancer. It's not working for a, a systemic metastatic cancer. The standards of care are not working. And that's what's killing the majority, allowing these poor people to be dead. So when are we going to shift this standard of care away from these toxic strategies, not based on the underlying biology of the disease? That's a question people have to ask themselves, right? Well, this, like the you said, ties back to what we were talking about earlier. The fact that therapies like you're talking about not only have to overcome the cancer, but also the conventional treatment that has to be stacked on top of it. So it's, yeah. we're coming full circle here. Yes, you're coming full circle. And the biggest thing they always say is ketogenic diet safe. Is ke ketogenic metabolic, is metabolic therapy safe? They're always worrying about the safety issue. Are you kidding me? You're telling me that a calorie restricted ketogenic diet is more harmful to the body than high dose radiation and chemo? They, they should be asking whether radiation and chemo is safe, <laughs> not whether whether a, a metabolic diet is safe. I mean, it's completely upside down, right? I mean, it makes no sense. Um, oh, is ketogenic diet? We have thousands of little kids using ketogenic diet therapy for managing seizures, right? Thousands of kids all over the world using it to manage epileptic seizures. And now we try it in a can. Oh, no, we got to be careful. It might not be safe for the cancer patient because they, they, they relative to what? Radiation and chemo? I mean, let's, the, the, the absurdity of some of these things is just beyond my comprehension. Well, speaking of safety, that gets me thinking about diet, where we've talked about to this point where we're cutting things out, we're getting into ketosis, and then we're adding this drug in, which again, triggers in my mind, how do we make this even less invasive and potentially safer? And that's instead of using the Dawn to have a food or a, a substance extracted from food that could do the same thing. So- 
anything in that realm that you've discovered or anything promising where you could see a food well, or an extract from food taking the place of the drug? Yeah, well, I, for glutamine, not yet. Um, for glutamine, not yet. Now, we have a paper under review uh, with a dog um, that has a, metas- a, a malignant mast cell tumor on his face. And I've in some of my um, lectures, I've shown pictures of that dog. Um, that was kind of a surprising case uh, because um, the, the the owner, the what they call pet parent, uh, brought the dog into the um, uh, the vet clinic, and they dis- they discovered under its lip it had a it had a, a mast cell tumor. They did a biopsy on it, and um, it was a mast cell tumor. So if you look in the in the literature. Uh, on mast cell tumors in dogs, that when they do genomic screens, they find a lot of all kinds of mutations in the cells in mast cell tumor. So it's like just about all the other kinds of tumors. You see all kinds of all, all kinds of uh, mutations. So um, they wanted to give the the, the recommendation was chemo um, and radiation. Like you know, these are the standard things that they would do. Uh, the pet parent said no. They didn't want to do any of that because the outcome. Uh, would not always be guaranteed, uh, and their pet would be uh, injured. It would be very sick. Uh, they they said this dog would be very sick, and may not your outcome may not be a cure. So she said, "Well, I don't want to do that. I, I'm just going to figure out on my own." So she went back. The owner, in fact, all this is written in the paper that hopefully will it's under review right now. But some of the reviews are pretty good, so I anticipate that it'll be out at some point. Um, she switched the dog to a raw vegetable diet. Okay. So uh, uh, for a year, a little over a year, and the tumor grew much bigger, okay, on this raw vegetable diet. So clearly the raw vegetable diet was not working. Um, and the tumor became very noticeable and large and started to uh, invade local local area, m- meaning that it, it is malignant. In fact, it was malignant by invading local tissue when it was very when it was first diagnosed as a smaller growth, and then the raw vegetable diet made it much bigger. Um, then she read our work and, uh, recognized that the dog is a descendant of the wolf. Uh, all dogs are derived from the wolf. Uh, what does the wolf eat? The wolf eats raw meat. Uh, the wolf can eat anything but vegetables. So, uh, uh they took the, all the vegetables away from the dog, um, and gave the dog, um, raw chicken, uh, uh, uh fish oil, a raw egg, and some coconut oil, uh, small amounts, teaspoon, tablespoon levels. And the, bo- the dog uh, was calorie restricted and lost him only about eight or 10% of its body weight. And within uh, three months, this big ass tumor was like gone, um, which, which was remarkable. And we used no drugs. There was no, there was no uh, extra drugs used. It was purely diet alone that did this. And people are asking, well, if you're talking about the glutamine, how is it possible that this big tumor could be resolved in a relatively short period of time without additional drugs? Um, And the answer is, you know, we don't really know. Uh, All we know is that the tumor was growing rapidly and big, and the rapid change in diet caused it to resolve completely. And the dog, which was a pit bull, uh, died at 15 years of age from heart failure. And and the tumor never never returned. The tumor was eliminated in 2015, and the dog lived to 2019. So clearly, it was cured of its cancer. Um, the question is, how do you explain uh, radical remission of this tumor without using the drugs that we think would be more successful? And the answer is, we're not really 100% sure, but it comes back to the fact that those mast cell tumors cells are loaded with mutations which, as I said, block uh, metabolic adaptation. So the tumor cells with their mutations can't, could not uh, r- uh, redirect their metabolism when the, sugar, when, the, when the body was asked to be under a more restrictive metabolic state. Those cells were unable, obviously, were unable to adjust. And that's where these collection of mutations in the tumor cells could be our ally when we start to put the whole body under a restrictive state. Dogs have an incredibly capable 
uh, adaptation to physiological stress. And if you have a cell loaded with mutations, that cell will not have those cap capacities and will be eliminated for fuel for the rest of the body. Um, so this is uh, what we call autolytic cannibalism. Can it happen in people? Probably for some kinds of tumors. Will it happen for a glioblastoma? I don't think so. But maybe it could. We don't know. But if, if it were me and I were the one to have uh, colon cancer, bladder cancer, or whatever, I would certainly use some of the very non-toxic drugs that I know would push the diet to make it a little bit more powerful. Uh, I'm not going to risk my life knowing that I have drugs available that I can use that are not so toxic and that could push these cancer cells out of existence a little faster. Is it possible that I could go on a 30-day water-only fast, which people do, and eliminate the cancer? Yes, it's possible. I, I have evidence from clinical clinicians who have emailed me and told me that their cancers were completely dissolved after 25 days of water, several water-only fasts like this. Well, this is really tough. I think most America, most people would probably figure out, can I get that done a little bit easier? Do you have a drug that might be able to push it a little bit faster? And the answer is yes. If people want to try a 21-day water-only fast three times a year uh, to get rid of their cancer, I'm not going to stop them. I, I, I've seen it work. But, it's not, it, but if you told a cancer patient that, uh, they'd think you were crazy. Um, uh, even oncologists think you're crazy to recommend something like that. But it works. But I wouldn't say it's something that everybody is going to jump on, especially if they have an opportunity to uh, lessen, <laughs> lessen the stress. People don't. People don't. You feel, oh, Jesus. But, but you can do all these things. Yeah, they work. I mean, probably work on some people. Worked on Guy Tannenbaum. He's on the web. He's, he, he did all these water-only fasts. He got rid of his advanced prostate cancer. So I'm not saying that's going to work for everybody, but I would certainly want to integrate diet with drugs where I know I have some handle on the whole thing. And, and that would, to me, would be a more logical way to go about it. That's exactly where I was going. I'm glad you covered that, though, to compare water fasting versus the treatment protocol we've been talking about. Yeah. I mean, it, sure, they, they can work. I'm not going to, because I have hard evidence that it does work, but it's not something a lot of people are going to jump on right away. So we've gone into the details of what your treatment protocol would look like with the diet or the fasting and the the pulsing of the drug, the Dawn. I'm curious now how long, obviously it's going to depend on the type of cancer and, and how invasive it is and how long it's been there and a lot of different factors. But if somebody is trying a protocol like this, how long typically do they need to do something like this to get to a point when they can, you know, go to a diet and lifestyle to manage the cancer at that point versus all these other things? Yeah, no, it's hard. It's a good question. I, I, I don't know. Um, well, I mean, what are your choices? <laughs> right? I mean, what are your choices? Uh, well, someone could say, listen, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. And the answer is you might not have to do that, but we can't be 100% sure uh, about that. Let me give you let me give you an example from a couple of one case published Pablo Kelly and, and the other case uh, from an individual that that I know um, uh, from Norway and uh, he's he did a big film on this and it's all in Norwegian um, uh, Ter, uh, Terje from Norway and he we have two examples of what the question exactly to address address your question Pablo. Um, took no radiation, no chemo, no steroids. Uh, his tumor continued to grow for three years, slowly, slowly. He was in a carnivore kind of keto, uh, mostly meats and stuff. Um, and eventually it grew to the point where he had to have it debulked, cut out. Because we all looked and he said, it's not, it's not be, this diet alone without drug is not causing your tumor to regress completely. So he had it debulked. First, they said it was a non-operable uh, tumor. It was uh, inoperable. So you wouldn't be able to get it all out. Then after three years of ketogenic metabolic therapy, th they looked out of the CAT scan MRI and said, oh, this thing might be uh, debulked more completely than it was three years earlier. So he said, okay. So he gets the tumor out. And they, the, the, uh, neurosurgeon, the neurosurgeon said, we think we got most of it. Oh, okay. So Pablo thinks he's out of the woods. Um, goes back not to uh, the same kind of, he was keeping his G glucose ketone index pretty good around 2.0 or below. 
after the debulking surgery, they said, oh, he looks like we got a lot of the tumor out. So he started to transition back to a more carbohydrate kind of diet. And then the next MRI about, um, I don't know, six or eight months later, showed growth um, of the tumor. So put the fear of God in him. And he went right back onto a more restricted diet. And you could see the damn tumor, the, the images going down. Now, after another three years, the tumor was continued to grow and grow, but very slowly and debulked. So he's had two debulking surgeries. Um, he's out over eight years of survival. He's got married, has two children. He would have not had any of that had he, had he done the, the standard of care up front. So the question is, will he have to use the rest of his life? And he, so far, he hasn't taken Don or uh, Embendazole or some of the other drugs that we know ca can work on this. He's very comfortable the way he's doing. The other, the other fellow from, um, had melanoma uh, from Norway. And he could actually see the lesions on his leg get bigger the more the more carbs he took in. And when he stopped the carbs, he could actually see the lesions go going down. I mean, it was like he had the pictures of going up and going down. It's unbelievable. So he said, listen, if I want that tumor out of my body, I got to stop taking these carbohydrates. So he switched over his diet to meats and all kinds of things, but very, very low in carbohydrates. And he's, he, he's fine. I mean, he's been out years now. And um, he, he knows that this may come back, but he just prefers to change his diet and lifestyle so it doesn't come back. And that's the individual choice that people are going to have to make. Does that mean you have to drop out of society just so you don't have your tumor grow? No, it doesn't. I mean, he's perfectly interactive with all kinds of people and uh, conventions and, and, and lectures and all kinds of stuff. So, but I think you really probably have to really restrict uh, the kinds of foods that make your blood sugar go up. Um, I think that's the safest way, but you're rolling the dice. And, and I have no idea whether someone who has managed their cancer for several years without a recurrence, they really feel good about their life, their health, and then all of a sudden they, they want to go back and enter into uh, a diet that has a lot of carbs in it most of the time. And I don't know uh, what we can say about it. We haven't had enough uh, examples and publications to show, let's take two groups of people. One's metabolically managed, doing really, really well. Another group that was metabolically managed really, really well. Let's keep these guys on their same diet and lifestyle, and let's let these guys return to the way they were before they had cancer. And then compare and contrast the two groups. Who's going to do a trial like that? You know, think about it. You, you talked really about the drug when you were talking about Pablo's case. I yeah. wasn't sure if he had any of the drug. Did he have any Don early on in his treatment? No. Nothing. Okay. And in, in the second case, any Don in there at all? Or no, no. No. So um, we only know Don works really well because we have preclinical studies to show that it does. And it works a hell of a lot better on the metastatic kind of cell than it does on the stem cells. Not to say that it doesn't work on cancer stem cells, but you know we're building these cocktails all the time, diet drug cocktails. And as I said, the two fuels are glucose and glutamine. So the diet drug cocktail is designed to keep the rest of the cells healthy while you strategize on how to shut down glucose and glutamine. So some tumors are more glucose dependent than glutamine dependent, and some tumors appear to be more glutamine dependent than glucose dependent. But that doesn't mean they use, they're use they restricted to one fuel versus the other. It's just that their proportionality of using the two fuels can differ. So our, our viewpoint is, what's the best th therapy that will uh, eliminate those two fuels simultaneously. Uh, and then and then if we find out there's still some level of growth, because don't forget, as I said, there's many steps in that glutaminolysis pathway that could be targeted uh, with some drugs. And we're still learning about that. So, I mean, believe me, this is not a, a done deal. Uh, we, we've just opened the door into a, a world of new approaches for managing cancer. Uh, and in the future, we'll be able to build much better diet drug cocktails to take care of all of these outlier cells and all of these kinds of things. We're just telling you that the, the, the framework uh, by which the strategy will eventually be built on this press pulse concept. Uh, but the physicians, clinics, guys, these guys are going to be the ones perfecting all this stuff when they see the outcome in their treated patients. So it's like anything. You're going to learn diet doses, timing, and scheduling for various types of people, their body weights, sex, the age, all of these kinds of things must be brought into consideration. How many other uh, diseases do they have besides cancer? 
And this is another thing. We've seen patients come into the clinic. They, they have parasite infections. Their blood work looks like hell. I mean, they're all off the metabolic in a many different type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension. They have all kinds of things. All that stuff has to be brought back into a semi-normal state. And then you strategically use low doses of drugs to target and kill the tumor cells while not putting the patient at a metabolic uh, balance. So again, you really have to be the artesian of the understanding of the human body and how it works uh, and how best you can fit that patient with the, with, the, with the therapy. So when it comes to published research and it comes to drugs like Dawn and other drugs in that family, is that only been looking at animal models to this point? Well, um, they no. There, there are clinical trials on some of these drugs that are going on right now. Uh, the problem with these t trials is no one is combining the drug with the metabolic therapy. So they want to see if a, a glutamine tar yes, glutamine targeting drug has been used in the past. Was it a blockbuster? No, it was not a blockbuster. Does it become more powerful when you put it with the ketogenic? Absolutely. So, but they don't want to do that because they want to get the, uh, the, they're looking for uh, don't forget the Food and Drug Administration says if you can, your patients can live an extra two months, we'll we'll give you approval uh, on that drug. I mean, we don't want extra two months; we want years of of so. But they will not do the trial with the ketogenic diet because I was told by several drug guys we won't know if it's the ketogenic diet or the drug that's making the difference. We got to know if it's the drug. I said, what about the patient? Ah, it's got to be. We got it's not the patient; it's the revenue generation from the drug they make. So again, what's your, what's your strategy here? Is it keeping, how long can you keep your patient alive? Or is it, is it how, how are you going to be able to make this drug a blockbuster? None of these drugs are ever going to be blockbuster. I can tell you that right now. The only way you're going to get real powerful therapeutic benefit is you got to know how to use that drug with the appropriate diet to get the full power of what you're doing. And so far, nobody wants to do that. Given the nature of this conversation, it's going to bring a lot of people to it who have cancer and probably a lot of people who are at a point in their journey where they don't feel like they have a lot of different options and they yeah. might be far along their cancer, you know, journey yeah. stage four being, you know, one extreme or people that have other people in their lives that are dealing with cancer and, and are looking for alternatives. So where I'm going with all this, it sounds like this is all very new and there's not a lot of areas to turn for treatment of the type we're talking about today, there's a lot of roadblocks in people's way. Yeah. So if it was you or somebody that you know in your family that came to you and said, Dr. Seafried, I wanna try this. Yeah. Where do they go these days? While this is so new and there's not a lot of people doing it. I know, well, I, there, there's some small clinics that are starting to dabble in this stuff. But I, like you said at the beginning, you know, you could be shut down because you're not following a uh, standard of care for, for political reasons, has nothing to do with the, the clinical. Uh, they're shutting it down because they don't understand it. They don't know about it. But because you're not following protocol, I mean, you, these poor, as you said, some of these poor guys could lose their license for doing it. You will not see um, metabolic therapy uh, discussed in any degree at the top medical schools. Um, you got to deal, deal with the, they never heard of Otto, many of them never heard of Otto Warburg. Many of them never heard of what I'm talking about. So you have that wall um, uh, uh, of, of interference. And yeah, it, it's a problem. Okay, so how do we, how do we break, how do we get the word? You, you got to train physicians to know how to use the strategy, the technology. You got to, they have to be educated. They can be, this is not, um, insurmountably, some of the, the the actual into the the nitty gritty biochemical pathways supporting what I am saying does take a lot of in depth knowledge and research. There's no question about it. I'm just able to take it out of the the molecular mud and bring it into a comprehensible uh, strategy. But I'm in the mud all the time, uh, 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 trying to clean up what we know and how to improve what we know. But we are already far enough along in case reports and in preclinical outcome to know this is the path forward. We already know that. So if we know that, why are we not going in that direction? Because there are all these other issues. One of the biggest ones is revenue generation. How do we, how do we keep everybody's 
books balanced, uh, it's okay if I can bring in a new strategy to replace standard of care, but standard of care generates a lot of revenue. So how can we use metabolic therapy? It, who has the business model? What entrepreneur is going to step forward with a business model? Because everybody's going to be happy if I can earn as much money doing metabolic therapy as I would doing radiation and chemo. Um, but right now that hasn't happened. We, we're still looking for the entrepreneurs to figure out how to do this because I think the people want it. The cancer patients want it. The problem is we have this revenue issue that we have to get through. And I'm not that kind of a guy. I don't deal with trying to figure out that kind of, uh, to solve that problem. My problem, my, my goal is to show that this, be, this will be the future of cancer. It's just that we have to put the other parts of the puzzle together to make it that way. We have to have set, we can set up clinics. We can, all the top medical schools could be doing this right now with a little bit of six month training program, uh, knowing, knowing how classes and re-education and research, but who's going to make the money on this, right? Where are the money, where is the money going to come from? I can manage your cancer without toxicity on the cheap. Great. Okay. How is that going to help our industry? I don't know. Somebody's going to have to figure that out, but it's going to happen. You can, you can delay it only for so long because the more and more people that are using this and the more and more people are surviving a hell of a lot longer they would have been if they had gone to standard of care is eventually going to be a grass fire. And people are going to say, I want this. You're going to have to adapt in some way because we want it. And we want it. Why? What do you think? Because we understand the biology. We're, we're actually targeting the very essence of what those cells need to survive without the toxicity. And, and we can do it. Absolutely. We, we already have the drugs. We already have the know-how. We just, we just don't have the motivation to do it. And, and that's something that I can't, I can't address. For somebody who is desperate enough and, and determined enough and is tuning in right now, are there clinics out of country? Is there stuff overseas people can look to down in Mexico? If you can't answer yeah. that, fair well, enough, but I just have to push you on it to give people yeah. something that have tuned into this point and feel like I'm desperate. And the other factor here is time, especially for people that, you know, might be more towards the end stages of cancer. They don't have a lot of time. So I just no. feel for people and I want them to have something practical they can grab onto at the end of this. You, you, you feel for people. Think about how, how I feel for these folks. I mean, they're coming to me. I get some letters of people that are in the end stages of their disease, and I can't believe that they could still be alive after what they have gone through in, in up to the point when they're, they're, they're desperate. They're at their end of their, 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 their string here. They're going to hospice for crying out loud. And now they're coming to say, can metabolic therapy be helpful to me? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, I'm not saying, I'm, I can't tell people, oh yeah, we have the panacea for your problem. No, I don't. I mean, the, the issue here is that we have a planned strategy to manage cancer, and it's done differently than what, this, than what they do in the, in the major medical centers. So it's based on a completely different underlying theory of what the disease is. And again, they always say, if you catch the disease early, you can, you can potentially cure it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's true for metabolic therapy as well as it would be for standard of care therapy. But um, as you mentioned, Jesse, you now have to take, you now have to use metabolic therapy to not only try to kill the remaining tumor cells or what's ever growing, but now try to re correct all of the massive damage that was done to your body by toxic poisons and radiation or Im immunotherapies or, or all this stuff. So you're asking a new approach to not only solve the original problem, but to create, fix the mess that you already went through in trying to you uh, use those failed procedures to manage your disease. So this is a real um, tough thing to expect uh, on an emerging therapy uh, to try to, now that doesn't mean those four, those folks can't benefit from this. I have seen the paper we published on the woman with breast cancer out of the clinic in, in Istanbul. She was from, she was from Ohio, uh, advanced uh, triple negative breast cancer to the brain uh, which is really bad, liver and brain, when you get your cancer spreading to your other organs, especially the brain, it's usually lights out. And, and they said, there's no more we can do. Well, that, that woman went to the clinic 
and uh, she was in the emergency room for quite a while. She was near death, but they fixed her up, got her back, and she had to go through this metabolic therapy for for a couple three months. And eventually, she uh, returned back to the United States, um, and is really good. I mean, um, I, I know these anecdotal things sound crazy, but but we have her doing doing really really well. We have evidence what her tumor was, how much it metastasized, how bad it was, and now she's alive and she's and she's looking pretty good. And that's why I think you have to look at the the survivors in the um, uh, the movie. Uh, cancer Revolution, where Maggie and Brad Jones have interviewed uh, these cancer uh, terminal, so-called terminal cancer patients, who have rallied. I, I think I think the issue is is that how how healthy is the per if some of these people say you know I've been through everything and they tell me I only have six months left. How do you feel now? Well, I actually feel pretty good. Well, if that's the case, you may be able to adjust to metabolic therapy. But I you know when you somebody's calling you from hospice and they're saying can you help me. You know, it's really hard. I hate to say it, but it's 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 hard. So uh, and it's hard for anything. They wouldn't be in hospice if something something worked in the first place. So uh, um, yeah, so it's a judgment call, and you have to have a team of physicians that have to make those judgments, work with the patient, with the family, but at least provide them with options and opportunities that they presently might not have. It's always a hard thing to say. Well, we've done everything. There's no more we can do. I mean, that's the that's a terrible thing to tell tell somebody, especially after you threw the kitchen sink at them, you know, spent all this money and all this crazy stuff and that doesn't work. I mean, this is tragic. This is tragic. This whole cancer thing is just a massive tragedy, a human, human humanity, a, tra a tragedy of humanity. How do you feel about cancer screenings? There's a lot of different methods out there, mammography, needle biopsy, and we could go on and on. Yeah. If somebody has well, signs and symptoms and they feel like they might have cancer or their doctor's screening them, what I'm getting at here is, is there a continuum from, you know, good, better, best when it comes to assessing? And I've heard of things like thermal imaging that are less invasive or supposedly. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about all that? Well, I think the, the, um, any kind of imaging that does not, is non-invasive. Uh, could be potentially helpful. So um, a non-invasive imaging, like you said, thermal imaging, they're, they're trying to work on, 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 on blood biopsy, liquid, liquid biopsy, which I think uh, the, the president's uh, moonshot project, I hate to call it that, it's, but he has a, a, a component in there for building, uh, looking more into liquid biopsies <clears throat> where, where you can take in the blood and look and see if you have certain cancer markers uh, that might predict uh, whether or not uh, you should have a certain type of treatment. But there's still a lot of false positives and false negatives associated with that. I, I think MRI, PET scan, anything that you can use to get an assessment. My, my colleagues that, are, that work in the area, the radiologists, uh, these kinds of guys, they're pretty sure when they look at a, a, an image, not 100% sure, but maybe a pretty high percentage sure, to know whether that mass that you're looking at is malignant or not. Okay. Now the field de de determines that in order to make that decision, you need to take a biopsy of, of, of the tissue, look at it under the microscope, and then confirm what the um, a radiologist has already uh, predicted. That uh, that yeah, that's malignant because I can look at the edges. I can I can look at the image the way it looks and angles, and and they can pretty much determine whether this is bad or good. Um, or how bad it could be, but the the ultimate determination comes comes from the biopsy material, where a pathologist looks at the the number and structure of the cells. My concern with that is that I have read many, 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 many papers where the very uh, process of taking sample from the tissue could provoke the microenvironment, uh, leading to a tumor cell dissemination from the very procedure to, to look at the tissue to determine whether or not it's malignant. Now, if it's not, if it's a benign tumor, then you would never really need to, to take a biopsy from it. Um, if you could assess that it would be benign, you can just cut it out and debulk it without really doing much else. But if it is malignant, the last thing you would want to do is take a biopsy of that tissue, leading to the process of now spreading it through your body. And people say, oh, it's very rare. I agree. I didn't say it's very rare. It's not common. Uh, biopsy of patients' tumors 
to cause it to be uh, a terminal malignant cancer is in fact not common. However, there's enough papers in the literature to say that it can happen in multiple different cancers, not only brain cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, uh, all these different kinds of cancers that I've seen um, where they can stay actually uh, spread the tumor cells around from biopsy. Yes, it doesn't happen. It's not a common thing. But what, what about the poor patient that dies from that it, needlessly? Okay. For that person, it's lights out. That didn't need to happen. You know, they used to have the morselation procedure for uterine polyps in women. Okay. They pulled that off the market. Why? Because it's like a kind of a, a, a lawnmower who gr grinds up the polyps uh, in the uterus. And people were getting metastatic cancer and dying from the grinding up of the polyps. Because if one of those polyps happened to be a malignant polyp, you're spreading the malignant cells all over the place. So they had to stop this morselation procedure. That was exactly what I'm talking about. So you've got to be very careful. You don't want to stick the hive when the bees are all in and have the bees come out. You got to you got to get rid of it before they they can come out. That's why I said if you see something, go on metabolic therapy, see if it disappears, and if it doesn't disappear and it becomes smaller, debulk it, get rid of it. <clears throat> you know, don't don't go and chop around on it. This kind of stuff. That's what I was getting at. I'm glad you're able to decipher. There's a continuum from bad to good when it comes to screening, mm -hmm. which yeah. isn't even into the therapy, all the stuff we talked about before, which is another whole area that people right, have to right. decipher through and figure out their own path. You're absolutely right. So everything has to be done strategically, causing the least amount of stress and harm to the patient under any conditions. And again, each patient is different from another patient. And the sharp people who understand screening can make those decisions. If they're trained to know how to make these decisions and then be very careful about their recommendations, I think a lot of people will benefit from this, or at least you won't let some people die needlessly from, from a lack of knowledge. To this point, we focused on treatment of cancer for somebody that has cancer and they want to take an alternative path. What I want to end on with you here is for somebody who is in quote unquote healthy shape right now and what I want to do is pick your brain as somebody who knows the physiology of cancer, what we can do preventatively to live a healthy lifestyle and hopefully not get to the point where we have cancer and have to make treatment decisions that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, well, everybody likes to talk about it. Nobody likes to do it. Um, prevention of cancer is, um, is something, it's very difficult in our in our lifestyle, in the Western lifestyle, uh, to everybody's rolling the dice uh, with the hope that they're not going to get cancer. It's diet and lifestyle and our culture that is ultimately responsible for us getting cancer. And not only cancer, heart disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity. I mean, these things are all linked to the same problem, which is poor diet and lack of exercise. Um, if people were really interested in cancer prevention, if people were really interested in cancer prevention, we would not have an obesity epidemic, okay? We would not have an obesity epidemic if people were really interested in cancer prevention. If obesity is a major risk factor for getting cancer, why, is, why do we have an obesity epidemic? All right, simple question. Um, why do we have an a, a, a epidemic of type 2 diabetes? If people were really interested in preventing cancer, because diabetes and obesity and all these things are all linked, making you at a higher risk for getting cancer. Because our diet and lifestyle is preventing us from the prevention strategy, right? I mean, uh, I mean, look at look at the fast food that we have. I mean, you don't even have to get out of the car, and they hand you the food through the window. Uh, there's even no exercise to get out. Our ancestors had to work very, very hard to get food. In the, in, the, in the Paleolithic period, uh, we had to hunt down and kill animals and, and skin them and cook them. I mean, this took a lot of energy, right? And there's no carbohydrate in that stuff either. So uh, our Aboriginal populations had no cancer. The great humanitarian physician, Albert Schweitzer, went into the jungles of Africa and said most people never had cancer. They didn't even know what it was. Eskimos, originally, when they were first looked at, didn't have cancer. They don't eat any, 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 any. They're all eating, you know, whales and blubber and kinds of stuff. And they never had cancer. Chimpanzees are closest relatives in biological terms. 
Uh, they don't never been a documented case of breast cancer in a chimpanzee, and yet now breast cancer has replaced heart disease as the number one killer of American women. Um, what the hell is going on here? So uh, the chimp is living on a diet lifestyle that he had when he first evo evolved as a species. We are not. We are far, far from how we evolved as a species. We are now in an environment rich with poorly nutritious foods, very little exercise. We're sitting in front of computers. We're sitting in cars. Um, okay, there's your risk. So you want, how do you prevent this? Well, we're all not going to go back and live in a cave. So, uh, so the issue is um, you've got to know what is the risk factor for cancer, and you've got to know how to prevent it. And as I said, if we have an obesity epidemic, that message is not getting out. As a matter of fact, they're blaming our genes on obesity. Our genes are doing exactly what they evolved to do, store energy because we starve for most of our existence on this planet. We need to have a good, a good physiology to store as much energy because we had to go through famine. We had to go through a lot of restrictions, these harsh environments, and we needed that energy. And those genes evolved over tens of thousands of years to allow us to store energy, okay? Now we're in an environment where there's poorly nutritious carbs everywhere. People are getting fat and they're getting cancer and they're getting all these other kinds of diseases. So if people were really interested in prevention, there would be no, no obesity epidemic. The fact that we have the epidemic means that nobody's interested in preventing, not nobody, many people in our society are not interested in prevention. Once you get cancer, what are you gonna do for me? Not that difficult. Well, I think the big challenge is that to prevent cancer, you have to go against a lot of the ways that society is naturally going these days. And you have to do your own research and live an yeah. alternative, quote unquote, lifestyle to try and get back, like you said, to the Paleolithic times. And there's a lot against us and it does take a lot of effort yeah. to figure it out and a lot of conflicting information for people that yeah. do decide to get in and do the learning. So I do feel for people and I hope having these conversations like I do help clarify for people and I do what I can to, to help clarify and for myself and for others. And I appreciate all you're doing in the world too. And this conversation was fantastic. We covered a lot and I really appreciate all the work you're putting out into the world and I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you have to realize that the research that we do here at Boston college is all dependent on private foundation and philanthropy. So, um, you know, uh, this is the more I preclinical evidence that I get to support this, the more it goes into the clinics and the more we can help people like that. So, uh, people can always help us out by supporting some of the foundations that, and you can find those foundations in the publications that we, I encourage everybody to read our papers. They're open access. So you don't have to go to a library. You can get them right online, you know, let them read the papers and see what they think. If people feel it's good, they can email me back and say, I got something better. You might want to, might want to try in your preclinical system. Sometimes I do. And sometimes I get information like that too. Well, we're going to link up for how people can donate below and we'll link up some of the papers. And again, thank you for coming on the show. All right, Jesse, thank you very much. Now that you're done my conversation with Dr. Seafried, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Fred. We go deep into his cancer story and how he overcame stage three colon cancer in four months. I'll see you over there. So I'm in front of the doctor and he tells me, okay, I have bad news. It's a, it's a, it's a cancer. The more I looked into it,